Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good. It's a beautiful sunny day. I hope you're looking forward to not only this day, but the week that God's got ahead of you. Um, I got to uh, just have a little quick uh, comment about my shoes. So I got my running shoes on here this morning. The, amen. Thanks. Uh, the reason being is immediately following the gathering today, uh, I am going to take 21 kids from the church to Word of Life Camp up in Scroon Lake, New York. Um, so we're very excited about that. I'm excited for all that God is going to do in their lives. And I share this with you now because, uh, A, I wanted you to know about my shoes. B, um, I know that there are prayer warriors in this church. And uh, each and every student, uh, God's got a perfect plan for them, right? And uh, they're going to go away. They're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun up at camp. But God's going to be speaking. And God's going to be working. And the prayer is that uh, they will hear the voice of God, that their hearts will be changed, that they will grow closer to the Lord, and that it will make a lasting impact. As these students come back from camp, all the more prayers will be necessary because they'll be excited. They'll be like on a spiritual high. And when you get back, that can soon be taken away. You know, Satan doesn't want to see kids succeed. So let's, as a church, rise up. Let's think about these kids. Let's pray for them. Let's come alongside them on their spiritual journeys. And let's be praying for them. So thank you so much, guys. Um, really looking forward to today. So we're in our uh, Summer in the Psalms series, and today I'm going to be preaching from Psalm chapter 9. Uh, the book of Psalms is a pretty cool book, 150 chapters, uh, all different types of things from poems and songs, um, and there's five different books. I, I, I don't know if you know this, but there's five different books within the book of Psalms. And all of these psalms, all 150, I think can kind of be put into almost two categories. We have praise psalms and we have lament psalms. Lament psalms are kind of a reflection from a really hard, difficult time where the writer is sharing hard times, crying out to the Lord, pleading to God for help, please help. Praise psalms are a little different, usually a little more jovial, a little more excited, and we're going to be looking at a praise psalm today, Psalm chapter 9. But before I even get into this, I really wanted to kind of just admit to you that the very things that I'm going to be preaching on today are something that I need to learn myself. Over the last couple of weeks, I had no idea. I'll say that I, I, I saw this psalm weeks and weeks ago, three, four weeks ago maybe, um, and so I started preparing this. I was excited when I, when I came across this psalm. I saw the joy in this psalm. I saw the praise. But what little did I know is what the, the, the last two weeks would bring. And man, I don't know where you guys are at in life, but the last two weeks were not praise weeks. They were really hard weeks, lament weeks. Some of you might be well aware, but our little buddy here at the church, Jack Davis, we celebrated his life this week with his funeral service. Jack was an amazing young man who knew the Lord. He believed in Jesus. And uh, after a five-year battle with cancer, he is now at peace. His body is healed, and he is dancing with his heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. But man, that was hard. That was really hard. On Friday, I went to a good friend's funeral for her brother who went home to be with Jesus way too soon. And the reality of it is, is just like, this is life. There will be lament moments. There are also praise moments. And today, we're gonna look at this psalm, Psalm chapter nine. I hope that it will serve as an encouragement to each and every one of us. I pray that there will be good takeaways for all of us. And I pray that today, uh, I don't, again, I, I, I truly believe that probably 90% of us in this room come into church each Sunday carrying some heavy stuff. You know, we'd like to think life is all great and all good all the time, and I'm not trying to be a doomsdayer guy, by the way. I'm not trying to just look at the negative. It's just the reality. The last couple weeks were hard. But I hope that this psalm will be an encouragement. 
So let me read it, and let's let God's word speak to our hearts. The psalmist writes, Psalm chapter 9, verse 1. I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. May the Lord bless the reading of his word here today. Now, unfortunately, I won't have the time to go through this entire psalm as much as I would love to. We can only look at the first 12 verses. And I gotta say, Pastor Rob's got it pretty good. I, I, don't, I think that that man is just extremely smart because he somehow finds all the good short ones. And he can preach a whole psalm on a Sunday. And if he can't preach a whole psalm on a Sunday, that guy gets two weeks. So I can only focus on 12 verses here today. And I hope that we can just find some good stuff here from the word of God. So throughout this chapter, you'll see that the verses are broken up kind of in sets of two. So I'm going to kind of focus on these verses in sets of two. Right off the bat, the psalmist is writing, I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The big thing that is happening here right off the bat is that the psalmist is just exuding great joy, great happiness. It's, it's almost like this picture of a, a, a big dam holding back a river and the dam is breaking forth and the joy is just spilling out. He is so excited. As Pastor Rob spoke last week on Psalm chapter four, that was a harder time. That was more of a lament psalm. Da David was in a tough spot. His son had taken the throne. He is in the woods, in the wilderness, running for his life. This is a different time for David. He's finding joy. His joy is overflowing. He is giving thanks to the Lord with his whole heart. I want to focus on this first, first line. I will give thanks to the Lord. There's something so amazingly powerful in thanksgiving. It can be very hard sometimes, especially if we go through a couple weeks of lament, if we go through a couple weeks of hard stuff. We can focus on the negative. We can get so caught up in it and just dwell in it and point fingers and just linger there. I don't know if that ever weighs so heavy on you that you find yourself just in this place of strong anxiety weighing heavy on you because of life circumstance. Well, I've had conversations with Pastor Rob about this, and I know that he's spoken on this from the pulpit, but he's had to stop me sometimes and say, Ben, don't forget the antidote for anxiety. Don't forget the, the antidote for, for when we're going through hard times, what we need to get back to and what we need to focus on. And David hits it right here in the first verse, and that's thanksgiving. Pastor Rob is, has reminded me numerous times of Philippians chapter four, verse six, where it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition, and this next part is important, and it's probably the part that we can so easily forget. It's with thanksgiving. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Make your requests known to God. And the verse continues, and it says that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I say all this because I, I just think that it's so important to look here at the psalmist just coming right, right off the bat with so much gratitude and thanksgiving. What about us, people? People of God, the church, what about us? Where's our thanksgiving? Let's be a thankful people. David gave thanks with his whole heart. I also want to just share a testimony. Um, our brother Lou in the house, uh, he got baptized back in, in, uh, on Easter. And one night in men's Bible study, I was sitting and talking with Lou, and, and uh, Lou works at a burn dairy um, right, right in Cicero. So if you ever want to stop in and see our brother, stop in and say hi to him. But as Lou is just learning more about the love and the goodness of God, uh, he, he was sharing with me that he had found moments where he's at work and he's just going about his job doing his thing. And say, for instance, somebody comes in and orders a slice of breakfast pizza and just accidents happen, right? Perhaps Lou would drop a piece of pizza on the floor or something. Lou was encouraging me that instead of getting angry and bitter or saying something he did not want to say, he would just say, thank you. If a grumpy customer came in, and was sharing their, you know, disgruntlement, if that's a word. Thank you. And I just found that so simple, yet so profound, that as Lou goes about his day, instead of finding a moment to be angry or let his heart go south, he just fought that with gratitude and simply said, thank you. And I find that so neat. So David says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. This is really cool. As he says, all your wonderful deeds. David not only is in this moment as he's writing, thinking about how God has been so good right there in his moment, but as he's recounting the past, as he's recounting the past, he's thinking about God's deliverance of the people of Israel. He's thinking back and how God has been faithful to deliver the Israel from their enemies. So he's thinking about the past. I, I, does anybody in the, in the room this morning like to take pictures? Anybody like to take pictures? Okay, cool. I'm seeing some hands go up. Cool. Well, I'm, tr I'm trying to learn the discipline of taking photos and doing it more diligently because what I have found is that when I'm in a, in a, in a time when I, I might be like... Uh, unhappy or forgetting God's goodness or something like that, it can be so easy for me to just open my phone and look at past memories and remember what God has done, things that have, uh, I've done with friends, family, loved ones, and remember the goodness of God, remember good memories. And David, uh, to me, is right here just recounting what God has done in the past, and we're going to look more at what God has done here in this, in this text. But I want to encourage you that as we are learning to give thanks and recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord, if you're taking notes, that's kind of our first point, is recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord. If you're following along in, in the notes section of the app, you can see it there. Verse two, and verse one really sets the stage for, for verse two, it like leads right in. So David's giving thanks, he's recounting the wonderful deeds of the Lord. But he says, I will be glad and I will exalt in you. This is the essence of David just sharing pure joy, pure heart joy. What brings your heart joy? What, what just causes you to elude joy? David is sharing that joy. The next, ver the next half of this verse I find so cool too is that I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I will sing. There's a, there's a leadership guru named John Maxwell. I don't know if anybody has heard of that guy, but he's been pretty popular over the, as long as I can remember. But anyhow, uh, the guy asks the question oftentimes in leadership seminars and talking with folks, if you want to figure out more of what God has wired you for, what makes your heart sing? 
And it's just kind of a cool little litmus test to consider what is the thing that when you wake up in the morning might cause your heart to just naturally sing? What brings that emotion right out of you that you can't help but connect your emotion with your voice and sing a little melody? So John Maxwell uses this as a litmus test to figure out the very thing that God perhaps has wired you for and the thing that you might be most fulfilled doing. What's cool is that the psalmist is showing right here because of the wonderful things, the wonderful deeds of the Lord, he will sing and glorify the name of the Lord, O Most High. And I want to say, great joy is in the works of God. Great joy comes from the works of God. But more importantly, greater joy is found in God himself. So if I could just even kind of put, paint a picture, is that David, is to, he's talking about the wonderful deeds of God, the actions of the Lord, right? His deeds are awesome, and they bring much joy. But as he says, almost high, almost high, he recognizes the height and the amazing weight of God himself. Great joy is found in the actions of God, but greater joy is found in God himself, And I just find that so cool and so powerful. Continuing on in this Psalms, God is, or David, the psalmist, is just alluding all of this, recounting the wonderful deeds of the Lord. But as he recounts the wonderful deeds of the Lord, he observes God's righteous judgment. Verse three says, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. When I first read this verse, I think that it could have been pretty easy for me to read it and then think about what is God going to do for me? I'm seeing God do some awesome stuff for David here, but what is God going to do for me? Man, I, I, I think I got some enemies. Nobody I think wants to punch me in my face, but I'm sure I have enemies. So what is God going to do for me? But I don't think that that's the heart of David here. We have to keep reminding ourselves that, that David is in this place of rejoicing. He's, he's praising. And, and I think that all of this just continually points to God. Yes, David does have enemies. But in, the, in the, what God is doing, it's, it's, it's God that gets all the glory. When my enemies turn back, it, they stumble and perish before your presence. Your presence being God's presence. God's presence is powerful, and uh, I just want to make note of that. I was on the phone with somebody this week that found themselves lonely, okay? This is another part of just kind of the lowness of the week. They found themselves in a place of, of loneliness. And praise God for Scripture, because I know that God's presence is powerful. I know that God's presence is sufficient. For, for David, he recognized that his enemies turn back, and when he says they stumble and perish, he is literally saying, my enemies will turn because of the presence of God. They will fall into their own nets. They will fall into their own traps because of God. He continues, for you, God, have maintained my just cause. Justice is in God alone. It's not about David, but it's about God maintaining justice. Justice. You have sat on a throne giving righteous judgment. To me, what's so important right here is to see God's righteous judgment. He's sitting on his throne that is not just a throne of royalty, but is a throne of judgment. And he opposes those who oppose him. It's so important to know that from the beginning of time, God created everything perfect. God created everything perfect. He, he, he gave us a, a desire for him. But it's the lust of the flesh, it's the pride of life when we go our own way and we choose to love ourselves more than we love God. And from the very beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin came into the world. And that sin separated every human being from the Lord. And God being a holy, good, righteous God cannot be in the presence of sin. 
But God is faithful and just. It says even in Isaiah that because of our sin, the Lord has turned away and will not hear the people anymore because of sin. But just a quick encouragement to the end of the story. While we were still sinners, God loved us. He showed his great love for us by sending Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice for sins so that we can believe in him, that we can confess our sins. The the word of God says he is faithful and just. He is faithful and just. He's a good judge to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness so that we can be saved and that we can know him, we can talk to him, we can have this relationship with God just as David had a relationship with God. So it's not hopeless. God is a judge, but God is a good judge. And he's given us ultimate hope in his son Jesus for all to believe. And so I I just want to bring note from verses three and four. God is a judge, a just and righteous judge that is sitting on his throne. But into verses five and six, he is a triumphant God. We can almost see that David in verses three and four talks about God's judgment and kind of correlates it with his own personal life and his own personal experience. But verses five and six go to the bigger picture to all of Israel. You have rebuked the nations, meaning any other nation that was like a Gentile nation that wasn't Israel. Nations that were against God. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. God, verses three and four, is a just God sitting on his throne. But he is a victorious God, victorious in triumph, verses five and six. And I also want to point out how many times did David say the word you in verses five and six? I see it four times. He is recognizing the goodness of God. People, I I hope that as we are learning together the goodness of God, we recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord, we observe his righteous judgment, but that we see God for who he, he is. And we love him for who he, he is. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right? So we're recounting the wonderful deeds of the Lord. David is worshiping. We're gonna continue in this moment of praise. This is a good psalm. He's recounting his good deeds. He's observing his righteous judgment, which is good, people. It is good. But verses seven, there is a shift here. There is a shift in tense, and I'm not talking about camping. It's one of my favorite jokes, sorry. It's a shift in verb tense, okay? So as we get to the end of verse six, um, David says, uh, the very memory of them has, uh, has perished. So the very memory of them has perished, but the Lord sits, okay, so so he's looking back. He, he's reminiscing on, on how God has delivered the people of Israel from their enemies. He's reminiscing on, on how the Lord has protected him and what God has done in his life. So he's, he's been looking back, thinking of the good things of God, maybe looking at pictures on his phone. I don't know. But he's looking back, and now he is looking forward, okay? So he's now looking forward, and he says, but the Lord sits enthroned forever, So in the past, the verbs were perfect, perfect past tense. Now they're changing, and he's stepping into this future, this future tense, but the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. This is good news, and he's looking into the future, and we can be encouraged by that. And I just kind of want to note that verses 7 through 10 David is starting to consider his future goodness. I hope that for each and every one of us, we can be diligent in recounting the wonderful deeds of the Lord, observing his righteous judgment, all the things that he has done in the past, how he has sent his son Jesus for us, how we can consider his future goodness, what he will do. That's what David is doing. 
And in this next, this, essentially this fifth pair of verses, it says this, thinking future. The Lord is the stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Does anybody relate? Can anybody feel this? Again, I feel like I could relate with this in the moment, these last couple of weeks that I've been in. The Lord is a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. There's some of these words here that just seem heavy to me. He says, oppressed, troubled, forsaken, hard stuff. But we have to remember that this is a hymn of praise. Actually, what's happening here in verses 9 and 10 is more of a glad contemplation for what will happen when God judges with righteousness. This word trouble here is a rare word used in this, this piece of scripture. It's a rare word that is used in this chapter, and it's also used in chapter 10. But basically, this word trouble is this idea of cutting off. And it can be related to somebody that is gone from distress to some even greater negative circumstance to despair. Just so heavy, so cut off, so distraught. But God is, is seated on high, making him a lofty stronghold for those who are crushed and for those who are downtrodden. Does anybody ever feel that way? For anybody that is feeling that time of trouble, the Lord is a stronghold. Look to him. He is there for you. He loves you. And he is so strong. Verse 10, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I find this so very, very cool. As I just said, like trouble, God's past judgments just show us that he is present in trials and he is perfect. He is a perfect defense. We can almost consider the goodness of God. We can consider his, his character as we look at what he has done in the past and we look to him in the future. He is a, he is a hill, like a fortress on a hill that cannot be accessed by any enemy by any foe, by anybody that would want to hurt you. He is strong. Furthermore, because of his past righteous judgment, we can grow in trust. There is here a growing trust in the people that are devout to learning and knowing more about God. When it says, those who know your name, it's, it kind of signifies, the, it points out these people that are dedicated to learning more about the character of God. People, I hope that for all of us, we can be men and women that seek God in his, in his word, in his scriptures, to learn more about his character. Because what's so cool, as, as we see his judgment and we've seen what he's done through history, and we know that he is faithful to do all that he has said that he will do. As we see his judgment, we see his hand. We can learn to trust him now more in the present. And as we trust him more, we will seek more of his character in the future. And as we seek more of his character, we will trust him even more. And to me, that's just so cool. God shows up, God does what he is good at, he is faithful. We can trust him. We can desire more of his character. We can trust him even more. And lastly, as we consider his future goodness, I think that it's important that we look at 11 and 12. And it says this, sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. This last point can really be our wrap up here today. The psalmist says this word sing. 
really re- goes right back to what he says in the beginning in the, first, in the second verse. But it's the same idea of sing praises to the Lord. His heart is exuding with joy and thanksgiving. He is singing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned on Zion, who as the Ark of the Covenant came to rest, the Lord sat in that place. His presence was with the people of Israel. Sing praises to the Lord who faithfully sits and is a good judge on his throne. Sing praises to the Lord. Tell among the people his deeds. That tell among the people, that's to the other nations of which don't know the goodness of God. And this isn't like tell among his people, tell among the people, you know, hey, God's judgment is coming for you. It's going to be painful. It's not a condemning tell. It's actually a blessing, which I find so cool because the people of God were called to bless other nations. Tell among the people his wonderful deeds. Brothers and sisters, for us, we are called to sing and tell. I actually had to reach out to Janice Cooper, our, our little lamb director, and I, I asked her, hey, is um, show and tell still part of uh, Little Lamb, the preschool? She said, yeah, as a matter of fact, it is. I was like, good, I didn't know if in you know, cancel culture somebody got offended by something way too cool and had to shut it down. But praise God, we still got show and tell. Because kids love to bring something that they really care about, something that really means something special to them. They bring it to school, and they're excited to show their friends, their teacher, hey, look at this thing that I have. And they share the story about it. This is what I have. This is where it came from. I love it. It's my favorite toy. Well, I just find it so cool that as a psalmist, kind of, well, our conclusion, but in 11 and 12, to sing praises to the Lord, tell among the people his deeds. We are to show and tell the goodness of God. We are to show and tell the wonderful deeds of the Lord. And I just kind of want to recap because for any of us that might struggle, well, what has God been doing? I swear God is probably doing 10,000 amazing things in our lives each day. We probably just need to take some time to sit down, pause, maybe grab a notepad, and just focus on things that we can be thankful for. And it might be things that are kind of negative, But maybe if we kind of take something from our brother Lou and think, you know what, this bad thing happened, but I can find this thankful thankful part of it. Maybe that would do us good to sit and just write some of these things down. I struggle with it. I'm gonna be honest. I need to do better. But if you're struggling, as you'll see in the notes section of your, your app, but let me just kind of point some things out. There's things right here that we can see God's goodness right from this very text. But in verse three, I just want to recognize that his presence is powerful. God's presence is so powerful. It's powerful to the people of Israel. His his presence was the very thing that could cause people to flee and run into their own traps. His presence is powerful. So thank God for his presence. Thank God that, too, he is righteous and he is just. We can see that throughout verses four and seven and eight. He is so righteous, he is so good, he is so just, he is so fair. God is righteous and he is just. And we can give thanks to him for that. We can talk about that at lunch. We can share that with our neighbors. Consider his future goodness, but we can also see his kindness and his compassion. His kindness and compassion, verses nine and 12. And lastly, He is a trustworthy God. He is so trustworthy. Everything that he has ever said, he has done. He has been faithful since the very beginning. He will never stop being faithful. There's a lot of people that make promises and they can't keep them. God has never made a promise that he hasn't fulfilled. He is trustworthy. And we can see that in scripture. We can see that how he, just here in this passage, we can see how God has been just. Because of that, that, that justice of God, we can trust him, we can learn more about his character, and we can trust him even more. Praise God. So brothers and sisters, as we leave from here, I wanna encourage us, myself included, to seek God in his word, first and foremost. 
We just got to seek him. We got to seek him. Because when we seek him, we will learn things like this passage where the big idea today is just recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord. I hope that if, if you, you don't leave here with anything, that you, you, you leave here with, recount the wonderful deeds. I must recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord. I want to recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord. Oh my word, the wonderful deeds of the Lord are amazing. I want to consider the wonderful deeds of the Lord. Let's recount the wonderful deeds of the Lord because I think that no matter what the season, whether it's praise, whether it's lament, the wonderful deeds of the Lord are always good and they're always powerful. And kind of as we wrapped up here, I just want to say share it. Let's share the word of God with people. Let's share the wonderful deeds with our neighbors, with our coworkers. Uh, even if that might be the hardest thing that we think we could ever do. Let's pray. Let's, let's figure out a way. Let's share the wonderful deeds of the Lord. Let's sing about it. Let's tell about it. Let's seek God in his word. Let's recount the wonderful deeds of God. Let's share it. Because that, that's what David's talking about here. Brothers and sisters, I love you. I know that we all go through lament. I know that we all go through hard stuff. David went through hard stuff. The psalmists go through hard stuff. But may the name of the Lord be praised. And may we learn to be a thankful people. Saying thank you. Let me pray.